of neuron to neuron. All right, now I do want to mention that when we look at synapses, we can classify synapses as to whether or not they will cause an action potential or inhibit an action potential. When I say action potential, I'm really talking about the formation of a nerve signal, a nerve impulse. So we have synapses called excitatory, excitatory, excitatory synapses. And we have some synapses which are inhibitory. And whether or not it's excitatory or inhibitory is going to depend on the neurotransmitter. and on the receptor. <clears throat> if it's an excitatory synapse, then the chances of an action potential occurring are very, very likely, meaning that a nerve signal will very likely occur. Now we're talking in the postsynaptic cell. So the presynaptic cell releases the neurotransmitter, it binds the receptors, and we have a series of events and those series of events make it likely that an action potential will occur in that postsynaptic cell or that a nerve signal will be generated in that postsynaptic cell. Inhibitory is just the opposite. It means that the likelihood of that postsynaptic cell actually undergoing the, the, the right events to create a new signal, a nerve signal, is unlikely. Now, there are times when we want to inhibit neurons. We don't want them to fire. That's where these inhibitory neurotransmitters come in and these inhibitory synapses. We'll get more into that next semester, and we'll look at the mechanism as to why they inhibit the formation of an action potential. It's not going to make any sense to you now because we didn't get into the physiology of action potentials and nerve impulses. But I just want to throw that out there. Let me go back to this a second, just to kind of maybe fill in some gaps. Maybe it's implied. I don't know. What happens in a synapse is that that nerve signal comes down. And a nerve signal simply is just the movement of ions. And as those ions move, it changes the, the electrical voltage, the electrical nature of that cell membrane, specifically of the axon here. The problem is, is when that signal reaches the synaptic knob, those ions that are causing that change in voltage, they don't jump across the synaptic cleft here. They can't. So in order to get those ions to start moving again in the postsynaptic cell, that's where the neurotransmitter comes in. The neurotransmitter binds the receptors. It starts those ions moving again, generating that nerve signal. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. Now, for our purposes, we really have two main classes of synapse, and it's based on their receptors, their neurotransmitters, and how they act. A cholinergic synapse uses acetylcholine. So if acetylcholine is being used as a neurotransmitter, it's a cholinergic synapse. Could you consider a neuromuscular junction a cholinergic synapse? Absolutely. It relies on acetylcholine. And in fact, the neuromuscular junction is an excitatory cholinergic synapse because acetylcholine creates an action potential, the movement of ions, in that skeletal muscle fiber, which we know is what triggers the release of calcium, binds to troponin, causes the tropomyosin to move out of the way, exposes the binding sites. Remember all that? Now, acetylcholine is a direct-acting neurotransmitter. What that means is that when acetylcholine binds to the receptor, it directly stimulates the movement of ions in that postsynaptic cell. It has a direct role 
in stimulating the movement of ions in the postsynaptic cell. It's direct acting. Now that's kind of the opposite of adrenergic synapses. Adrenergic synapses use norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, other monoamines, and some neuropeptides. are considered adrenergic. When we get into the autonomic nervous system next week, most of what we deal with as far as adrenergic synapses are concerned are going to be using norepinephrine and epinephrine. But adrenergic can refer to synapses that use all of those neurotransmitters. Now, when these neurotransmitters bind to receptors, they are actually indirect acting. They rely on what's called, or the cells that have these adrenergic receptors, rely on what's called a second messenger system. Show you a picture from your book. But if I think of it, I'll pop this picture into the video. I'm hoping the video records today. This is what I mean when I say second messenger. The neurotransmitter binds to the receptor. A big glare right there. Where's that coming from? Well, anyway, you can see this on page. 465. So when the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, what happens is it releases a protein, and this protein molecule then binds to another protein, which then causes a series of events. One of those events would then be to start the movement of ions occurring again. So it still causes the movement of ions, it just does it in an indirect way. It's like if I have a message to give to uh, Zach in the back there, I could give it to Pat, and Pat could give it to David, and David could give it to Zach. Zach is still getting the message from me indirectly. Okay? Or if I was direct acting, acting, I could just go up to Zach and say, here's the message, and give it to him directly. That's the idea. Now we'll get into the specific physiology of these receptors next semester and how they work and, and why, based on what happens, it's an excitatory or inhibitory synapse. <coughs> All right, so these are the two I want you to be most concerned about. I'm going to mention this, but I'm not, I won't put it on the exam. Is they can be either. Yep, they can be either. It just depends on what the target tissue is, if we're talking, you know, our organs and viscera. Now this GABAergic, remember GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, it is an amino acid that acts as a neurotransmitter. This one is strictly inhibitory. And your book mentions it, so I figured I'd just throw it in there real quick. So this is inhibitory. So this means that when this is released, it will bind to the receptors in the postsynaptic cell 
and that will prevent that postsynaptic cell from having an action potential, meaning that postsynaptic cell will not send signals. So there are some neurons that can send signals automatically without being stimulated, but sometimes we want those signals to stop and so a neurotransmitter like GABA would bind to receptors on that cell and prevent it from having an action potential. And then that changes the behavior of, of whatever else down the line. That's what happens in the visual system. There are inhibitory neurotransmitters that are used um, that actually prevent things from happening. And then when we take away those inhibitory neurotransmitters, then other events happen and we actually end up seeing. So in order for us to see and have vision, there are, we have to block the action of inhibitory neurotransmitters. Well, I was just going to say, like, with an example of yeah. that. Yeah. So in the visual system with the rods and the cones. Mm 